when we looked at the environmental samples, um, we kind of looked at it over a time point, and then we looked at you know all of them together, um, all replicates in one, mm -hmm. just to kind of get an overall view of what's going on. And when we did that, we saw that one of the bacillus isolates was um, had a significantly reduced recovery of coliforms mm -hmm. compared to the formaldehyde treated group as well as the pathogen mix group. Um, that same isolate um, also had a similar intercoccus recovery compared to the, pa the pathogen mix and formaldehyde treated group. Hello everyone, welcome to the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast where we discuss the latest trends in poultry nutrition uh, research and industry practices in approximately 10 minutes or less. Uh, my name is Sam Rochel and I am an associate professor at Auburn University and one of the hosts of this show. And for this episode, we'll be picking up uh, right where we left off uh, with a University of Arkansas researcher, Mitchell Rowland, uh, learning about uh, novel ways to apply technology uh, in the hatchery uh, to improve uh, poultry or particularly broiler uh, hatchability and, and early treat quality. So, uh, Mitchell, look forward to talking with you again, and uh, excited to to hear where we go with the rest of the story. So you've got it. You've got the isolates in, and uh, you've you've got your treatment. You've got eggs that are coming in. Uh, some you have added some potential pathogens to. You've applied the isolates, and then uh, you took um, various samples, including intestinal samples uh, from the from the actual hatch chicks. So what did you find when you did that? Yep. So um, when we looked at the environmental samples, um, we kind of looked at it over a time point, and then we looked at you know all of them together, um, all replicates in one, mm -hmm. just to kind of get an overall view of what's going on. And when we did that, we saw that one of the bacillus isolates was uh, had a significantly reduced recovery of coliforms mm -hmm. compared to the formaldehyde treated group as well as the pathogen mix group. Um, that same isolate um, also had a similar intercoccus recovery compared to the, pa the pathogen mix and formaldehyde treated group. Mm -hmm. um, so we were significantly less than the pathogen mix for both that bacillus isolate and the formaldehyde treated group mm -hmm. on intercoccus recovery. Um, when we looked at the gastrointestinal samples, um, the coliform recovery for both the bacillus treated groups and the formaldehyde treated group were uh, significantly less than the pathogen mix. So all three of our challenge treated groups were significantly less than just the challenge group. Um, and then for enterococcus recovery uh, in the gastrointestinal tract, um, the one of our bacillus isolates wasn't quite significantly less than the pathogen mix, but it was also not significantly different than the formaldehyde. Okay. So we were seeing a reduction in um, two or three, uh, really, but two groups of opportunistic pathogens that pose a pretty a pretty significant problem when we're looking at the hatchery space. Um, when we looked at the, the fluff samples, um, we didn't see the significant reduction in coliforms, but we did see a significant reduction in enterococcus in the bacillus and formaldehyde treated groups. Do you know or can you speculate as far as the, the mechanism of how these uh, aerosolized uh, is bacillus isolates are ultimately resulting in changes in the GI microbiota. I mean, is it, um, is it uh, something that's happening outside of what the chicks are then exposed to, or do you think they're actually, uh, the isolates are actually uh, being uh, consumed by the bird or, or taken in by the bird uh, to some extent too? We know that the, the bacillus are being um, internalized by the bird. Mm -hmm. We're not 100% sure whether they're uh, propagating or growing inside right. the gastrointestinal right. tract. Um, but from the gastrointestinal samples, actually from all three types of samples, we had a significant increase in um, total aerobic bacteria recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, when I say that, um, we didn't do any kind of uh, MALDI-TOF or 16S on the colonies we counted, but we counted colonies that represented a bacillus-like morphology. Yeah. Uh, so in all of the... And both of the bacillus tree groups among all of the sample types, we had a significant increase uh, in that. Mm -hmm. So we know that the, the bacillus were getting into the gastrointestinal tract. Now, whether there's some active um, antimicrobial activity going on inside the adjunct cabinet or inside the gastrointestinal tract, 
we haven't uh, evaluated that mode of action yet. Mm-hmm. Um, possibly some uh, competitive exclusion going on, right? We're mm-hmm. applying 10 to the 10. Um, I guess overall it'd be four by 10 to the 10 mm-hmm. uh, colony forming units into that hatching cabinet. So it's quite a lot of bacteria. Um, so it's possible that there's some uh, competitive exclusion going on. I had mentioned that there was the, the two the bacillus isolates that we tested um, did show in vitro um, antimicrobial activity mm-hmm. against right. E. coli and enterococcus as well as staph. So um, maybe there's some, some active uh, inhibition through metabolites that are being produced by the bacillus or um, something of that sort. Still a lot to learn to, to understand exactly what all's happening. With that said, what, what's your next step in this, this process? So um, we've actually we've actually switched gears a little bit using the same pathogen model, but we've gone to a, a novo administration of mm, lactic acid right. bacteria and bifidobacterium. So the idea there is to control colonization of the gut. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we want to evaluate that. Uh, we've switched the pathogens up a little bit during this whole process. I'm sure you and a lot of the members of our audience where the intercoccus acorum has mm-hmm. started popping up in broilers where it was more of a breeder mm-hmm. issue um, until recently. So we've, we've evaluated a few of those isolates and um, kind of swapped out the staff for uh, an intercoccus acorum. And so we're doing some studies evaluating um, that uh, using mm-hmm. the same hatchery model, but again, applying lactic acid bacteria in ovo. Ready for more sustainable poultry production? New data suggests that decreasing bacterial loads in feed using Termin 8 supports entric health, leading to improved performance. Gut health is more than a gut instinct. Learn more today at www.anatox.com. Very interesting. So it's a, another approach, similar kind of concept uh, about the early delivery of, of, of you know, probiotics, essentially, in, in just a different different routes and uh yeah very very neat to see uh i think this is a good timing on you know certainly the industry appreciates this uh this is a key challenge and so these are some real innovative ways to to try to get away and i think could be a very good story you know if if you could uh get this you know validated and and out there as as an alternative to traditional uh sanitation with with formaldehyde yeah, we're excited about it. I, I like talking about it, and sometimes I get a little long-winded. So, uh, sorry if that happened on this on this podcast. But, um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting project, and been working on it for quite a bit now. And it's good to finally start being able to to talk about some of the results and in a positive way. Well, that's great. Well, we appreciate your work. We're uh, getting long on time for today, but uh, thanks again for for sharing this with us and wish you the best of luck uh, moving forward on on figuring all all of this out before you complete your uh, PhD. So thanks again, Mitch. Well, thank you and thanks for having me. All right, you bet. And uh, thanks uh, to all the listeners today. And uh, if you're enjoying the show, please uh, like and subscribe on your favorite uh, platforms and we look forward to the next one.